She lives in Virginia with her husband and her daughter and another little one on the way. So we're really glad Mary Catherine could join us. Mary Catherine Ham and the Marijuana Debate Panel, ladies and gentlemen. Rocky Mountain High. my panelists do much of their introductions uh, themselves because they know themselves better than I do. Uh, I am Mary Catherine. Uh, I will start off by saying uh, a little bit about my position on this subject so that everybody knows my biases and can take them as needed while I'm moderating. Uh, I am friendly to Colorado's decision to experiment with new laws and ways of doing things uh, in the way we deal with drugs. I have gotten in many fights with Bill O'Reilly about this. I am not an activist on this subject, and then all of a sudden, because I fought with Bill O'Reilly, I became the weed girl. <laughs> My parents are very proud. <laughs> and Bill would be very disappointed that, in addition to arguing it with him about weed while I have a baby at home, I am now arguing about weed on a stage in public while pregnant. Um, <laughs> I'm a bad influence all around, he would say. But uh, that being said, I'm gonna try to keep it very open-ended and let these guys uh, exhibit their expertise, and, uh, and we'll see where things go. And I'm excited to talk about it in a place that's actually going through this and is actually sort of embracing federalism's concept of really being a laboratory of democracy on this issue. Uh, that comes with ups and downs, and we will talk about them. So with that, I shall first hand it over to Wayne Logason, uh, Colorado Springs Gazette. <coughs> Thank you, Mary Catherine. Uh, I'm no expert on the subject either. Mason is an expert, but I do live here in Colorado. I'm the editorial page editor of the Colorado Springs Gazette, second largest newspaper in Colorado, in uh, Colorado's second largest city. So, and um, my wife, who's in the audience over here, and I have six boys and uh, a seventh who we took in who needed a home because his uh, parents were drug addicts. So. Uh, Anyway, we are here to discuss Colorado's grand pot experiment, and uh, the world is watching us, and I can assure you as editorial page editor of the Gazette, uh, the Gazette is watching this experiment and watching very skeptically. Now, I was originally very skeptical of the Gazette's skepticism. <laughs> I have uh, been in Colorado a long time, since about 93. My wife moved me here from Washington, D.C., and uh, we spent the first 15 years in Boulder, of all places, and we just heard the song Rocky Mountain High playing in here. I love that song. Friends around the campfire, everybody's high. And, you know, my entire existence in Colorado, well, I've known that song before I was in Colorado. I, uh, it's always horrified me, the thought that one of those friends around the campfire could end up in a Colorado prison or jail uh, because everybody was high. And uh, I think a lot of people share that feeling. I don't think that most reasonable individuals, whether they voted for Amendment 64 or against it, want the casual marijuana user behind bars. And I think on that basis, Amendment 64, which legalized pot, had a lot of support right up front. You throw in that it might fund education and might end a horrible black market and do some other good things, and that's a pretty enticing prospect. Um, so Dr. Ben Carson was up here a little while earlier today, and he was talking about his uh, view, his vision, his dream for a country in which everyone can climb the economic ladder, particularly young people, so that they can get away from dependency and enjoy the American dream. And I think in this conservative audience, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of conservatism, that is a good thing. I think we all dislike dependency because conservatives like people. And uh, on another occasion this year, just a couple months ago, I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Carson in Denver, uh, specifically about marijuana. Because he is a 
world-renowned brain surgeon and scientist, I wanted to know his opinion on marijuana. And he reminded me that uh, reliable science has found that in young people, particularly uh, marijuana use, and we're not even talking about daily marijuana use, can lower the IQ by eight points. That concerned him very greatly. Um, we're going to hear a lot to hear today and probably in the future as this debate plays out about marijuana versus alcohol. And that, and I think, you know, I thank Mason for, for bringing that up a lot. He's written a book about it and he's uh, shed a lot of light on the evils of alcohol in this country. And we do pay a very high price for alcohol. But I think it's a bit of a false dilemma to say that because alcohol may be worse in some circumstances, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but even if, that, if, we, uh, if we accept that assumption that we should really not concern ourselves with marijuana and an industry that is pushing it onto our youth, it's a little bit like saying, um, let's not concern ourselves with curtailing diabetes because at least it's not cancer. It may cost you your eyesight, you may lose arms and legs and whatnot, but it's not gonna kill you anytime soon. So, uh, not too long ago, I had a conversation with another famous doctor, Dr. Charles Krauthammer, and he is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. And so I wanted to know his opinion, not just as a pundit, but as a psychiatrist. He is anything but an anti-pot zealot, used it himself in college, and uh, he said to me, he said, Wayne, if we could go back many years and redo this and go down the road with marijuana instead of alcohol, I think we might be better off in some ways. Now, I don't know whether I agree with that or not. Again, I'm not a scientist. My opinion on that, not terribly relevant. But he said, we can't get alcohol out of society. We can't go back and do that. It's enmeshed in society. The question now is, do we want both? And in Colorado, we very much have both. So we need to ask ourselves, what is this doing to the culture in Colorado, and what does it stand to do 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and in the rest of the country if they follow suit? Well, let's look at some of the costs of having both in Colorado right now. <clears throat> in Colorado, we have a higher marijuana use substantially than the national average. Now, unless you think that regular marijuana use is the ticket for kids to get into Harvard and Yale or to cure diseases or invent things and start businesses, then it's probably not a way to help us move away from dependence. We have a higher than national average among teens. Teen treatment is up in the state since legalization. Crime and homelessness are up. Ask any police chief or sheriff in Colorado and they will tell you that. Um, is it a gateway? I don't know, I've heard that my whole life. I've always been skeptical of that. I remain somewhat skeptical. But the fact remains we've seen a tripling, we just reported this in the Gazette a couple weeks ago, we have seen a tripling of heroin overdose deaths in the past four years. If this correlation involves cause, we need to find out, we need to do something about it. Um, hospitalization for marijuana in Colorado, up 128% since legalization. Workplace accidents and abs absenteeism are up uh, at the Gazette. We did a special project. Editorial board interviewed a lot of uh, executives, uh, primarily executives of the major construction businesses throughout Colorado, and they don't even want to hire in Colorado right now. There's too much liability. They're hiring uh, talented, clean workforce from Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Utah. That's hurting our state. Edibles have been a crisis in this state, an absolute disaster. Uh, you know, the state defines one serving of marijuana as 10 milligrams. You can walk out of a store with a bar of hash that can contain up to 2,800 servings of what the state says is a serving of THC. This has led to all sorts of edibles that children consume, uh, innocent looking gummy bears, gummy worms, you name it. They're eating them, they're ending up in the hospital. The uh, National Children's Hospital has seen a 610% increase in marijuana poisoning among children under six in marijuana legalization states. Dr. Carson, today, earlier, he also said, you know, that in a country of 300, I'll cut this short, 350 million people, every individual needs to be exceptional because 350 million people is not 
many compared to India and China, which each have more than a billion, and they want to be more like the United States. I'm guessing that in China and India, where they are working hard to become more like what we have been for the past 200 plus years, they are not in a race to copy a social experiment that stands to lower an entire generation's IQ by eight points. Thank you. Up next, we have Mason Tibbert, is that right? Tibbert, yeah. Tibbert, of the Marijuana Policy Project, making it hard for me to say his name and his affiliation. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you all for uh, having me here to talk about this issue. Um, you know, I guess the sky has fallen everywhere in Colorado, but in Steamboat Springs, where it seems still to be pretty nice out, despite marijuana being legal. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, so my name is Mason Tavert. I'm the director of communications for the Marijuana Policy Project, but I also co-directed the Amendment 64 campaign back in 2012. And I've been working on marijuana policy here in Colorado since 2005. I've also co-authored a book called Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? And really have spent uh, the last several years highlighting the relative harms of marijuana and alcohol and discussing laws and policies and how they steer people toward using the more harmful of the two substances. Now, ultimately, what it comes down to is this. Marijuana prohibition is a failed federal government program. It has been pushed on the states over the last several decades, and it has cost us billions of dollars, and it has utterly failed to accomplish much of anything. Marijuana is still incredibly available. Anyone who wants it can get it in every state throughout the country. Usage rates have not been going down. They've actually, in a lot of states, gone up, whereas we've seen alcohol and, and tobacco usage rates go down. So we really need to ask ourselves, not should marijuana be legal or illegal, but what are the potential costs and benefits of prohibition, and what are the potential costs and benefits of replacing that with a different system? And here in Colorado, what voters have decided is to create a system where marijuana is being regulated and taxed in a manner relatively similar to alcohol. Now, it's a different product, so it's not being regulated exactly the same as alcohol, but the idea being that it's a product that adults 21 years of age and older can possess and consume that is being sold by licensed businesses that are charging taxes, that are... Uh, testing their products, using proper labeling, using proper packaging, not selling to minors, and so on. Now, ultimately, 55% of Colorado voters in 2012 decided that this would be a more preferable system to prohibition. And since then, we've seen that support grow. Back in February of this year, a Quinnipiac University poll found that support was at 58% around the state. And in April, Another Quinnipiac University poll found that support was now up to about 62% in Colorado. So while everyone may have their opinions on whether it's working, not working, whether it was the right idea or the wrong idea, the fact is that it appears that most Coloradans seem to be pretty satisfied with where things are right now. Now, is that to say it'll be the case forever? I can't say that. I don't know. But right now, things ultimately seem to be going more or less how we intended them to go. Now, when we ran this campaign, we never said we're going to empty prisons and prevent people from going to jail because, quite frankly, simple adult marijuana possession doesn't generally land people in prison or jail. But it does cost people their jobs. It does cost people their, their housing. Sometimes people are unable to get jobs. Sometimes people have to go to court. They have to pay fines. Could you imagine if every time you were found to be drinking a glass of wine or having a beer while watching a football game, you were subjecting yourself to being fined $150 in a day in court? That seems kind of crazy. Now, ultimately, marijuana is less harmful than alcohol based on every objective standard. It's less addictive. This is according to the federal government. They've made it abundantly clear. It's less toxic. It's less damaging to the body. It's less likely to contribute to violent and aggressive behavior, recklessness, and so on. This is not to say marijuana is harmless. Nothing is harmless. Marijuana certainly has potential harm for some people. But that potential for harm is dwarfed by the potential for harm in alcohol. And don't get me wrong, I'm not here to say that alcohol is bad or wrong or that people should not use it. I think that as a country, we figured out what happens when you try to prohibit alcohol. It doesn't go very well. It actually causes far more problems than it solves, which is why our country decided to experiment with alcohol prohibition. It was known as the failed experiment, the great experiment, 
which we ended, fortunately, and decided to instead regulate alcohol and do what we can to control it and to educate people about it and reduce those levels of harm that could be associated with it without creating harm by forcing it into an underground market, propping up organized crime, ensuring that the product's entirely uncontrolled, that people don't know what's in it, people start going blind from drinking random uh, distilled liquors that they don't even know what they are. Now, up until 2012, Colorado was basically doing this with marijuana. Now, it's not as if marijuana wasn't in Colorado until we passed this law. Marijuana was incredibly available in Colorado. Now, rates of use in Colorado have not changed since this law passed. So the rate of use in Colorado was as high before as it is now. It has not gone up. So marijuana was here. People were using it. People could access it. Our federal government even referred to it as being, quote, universally available. People who wanted it could get it. But the question is, where were they getting it? They were getting it illegally from people on the street, from their friends, from whoever they might find it from. And that poses a lot of potential problems. Again, pro products aren't labeled, they aren't packaged, they aren't tested, people don't know what they're getting. Perhaps even more importantly, the people that they're getting these products from might have other illegal products available. So we talk about the so-called gateway theory, and what the research generally shows is that marijuana is only a gateway drug in that it's so popular that when people go to access it in an underground market, they get exposed to other illegal substances that they would otherwise not be exposed to. When you go to the liquor store to buy a bottle of wine, you don't stumble across or, or get offered cocaine. Well, if you're buying marijuana illegally from someone who has access to the underground market and illegal products, that can happen. So since Colorado has decided to change this structure, we now have marijuana being sold in licensed stores that are being more controlled, more regulated than casinos, than liquor stores, and that's another debate to have entirely. I know that this is a group that, that certainly has its, its skeptics you know, when it comes to government regulation. I think that when it comes to something like marijuana, like with alcohol, we need to have a healthy balance where we are ensuring the product is controlled, that only the people that are supposed to get it are getting it, and so on. And we shouldn't have over-regulation, especially regulation that could force sales back into the underground market because it's too burdensome on legitimate businesses. But so far in Colorado, things seem to be going pretty well. We now have hundreds of millions of dollars taking, uh, in marijuana sales taking place in these licensed businesses instead of in the underground market. We have very strict requirements on packaging and labeling, restrictions on advertising. You're not seeing commercials, you're not seeing that type of stuff all over the place and so on. Uh, what we're seeing are those adults who do want to go to a store to purchase marijuana can, and those who don't want to don't, which is how it should be, quite frankly. Um, in terms of its impacts on our society here in Colorado, we heard that this was going to cause a whole lot of problems. We were told that this was going to result in teen use skyrocketing. Now, first, let me be clear that those people who voted in favor of this initiative care just as much about the well-being of young people as the people who voted against it. You don't have to be anti-marijuana to be pro-youth. Uh, the difference is that the people who voted for this felt that there was a better way to protect young people, and that was to regulate and control this product, to make sure that the people selling it are actually asking for ID and only selling it to people who are able to prove they're 21 and older. And so what we're seeing now is that teen use rates have not changed. According to the state of Colorado, they have put out a report that says that teen use rates have remained stable since 2005, and when you look at the survey data, you actually see somewhat of a downward trend. Uh, in 2009, 24.8% of Colorado high school students said that they had used marijuana, and now it's down to 20. So people will say, oh, it's not statistically significant, and so be it. Maybe it's not. The fact is, it's not skyrocketed. We have not seen that huge increase in use. We've heard concerns regarding uh, people, young people who accidentally ingest marijuana. That's a an issue that we absolutely need to try to prevent. Now, the thing is, is that that was happening and could happen with marijuana being illegal. It's not as if it only started happening now. Now, I think a lot of people are probably more likely to report it because they're less fearful of being punished and being uh, criminalized or facing serious consequences. But ultimately, we need to also keep this in context. I don't want to minimize this, this potential problem because 
it is something that we, are tr that we want to prevent. And that's why we want child-proof packaging. That's why we want these products labeled so people know what they are and don't accidentally ingest them. But uh, Mr. Logson referred to this 600% increase in, in, in child exposure to marijuana. Do you know how many cases of, of, of people being accidentally exposed to marijuana who contacted Rocky Mountain Poison, uh, the Poison Center in 2014? 145 cases of which I believe about uh, 45 of those were, were people under the age of eight. There were, uh, let me pull the numbers out here just to make sure I get this right, 2,690 people five years of age and younger who called Poison Control for con consuming cosmetics. There were 740 for vitamins. There were 1,500 for cleaning products. So again, this isn't to say that we shouldn't worry about it. This is just to say that to claim that it's this massive epidemic that is out of control and a reason to go back to prohibition, not so soon. I don't think that, that we've really seen exactly how this is working yet. When it comes to crime, maybe if you talk to police officers, they can say that crime has gone up. I'd prefer to just look at the statistics of all the arrests and, and crimes that get committed and what the state compiles and puts together, and it shows that crime has not gone up. In fact, around the state, crime has gone down in a lot of ways. Uh, we've not seen any sort of increase in crime associated with marijuana. So these businesses, uh, according to the Denver Police Department and the Colorado Springs Police Department, are not attracting crime. In fact, the Gazette recently had an article about how its medical marijuana businesses in Colorado Springs are not attracting crime. In fact, all they're really doing is just generating some tax revenue for the city. We no longer, as a result of this law passing, we no longer have about 7,000 adults in Colorado being punished simply for using marijuana. Now, if you don't use marijuana, that doesn't matter, and I, I, I appreciate that that, that that doesn't necessarily matter to everyone, but there are a lot of adults out there who enjoy using marijuana for many of the same reasons that adults enjoy using alcohol. It's relaxing, it's social, they come home from work, they want to have a drink, they feel like using marijuana, whatever it may be, to each their own. Now, I think every drug should be treated based on its relative harms. And as I said, we're talking about a substance here that is objectively less harmful than alcohol. This isn't to say, well, let's just treat heroin this way and cocaine this way. We're not arguing that. We're talking about marijuana. And marijuana is less harmful than alcohol. So why is it that it should be a crime for an adult to come home from work or go out with their friends and consume marijuana instead of having a cocktail? About 7,000 people are no longer being cited and given a record for possessing an illegal drug now that this law passed. Moreover, I know that there was, uh, I heard some chuckles when we talked about uh, the introduction was made and uh, talking about the tax revenue being generated. When we ran this initiative, we made it very clear that the goal here was not to raise revenue, that that was a bonus. That the goal here was to end prohibition and all the problems associated with it and to start treating marijuana more reasonably. But, it is a bonus. We've generated a whole lot of tax revenue in this state, and the numbers keep growing. We've now seen, uh, uh, we're on pace to, to, to raise more than 100% of, uh, or excuse me, 100% increase over last year uh, for the state of Colorado. And is that to say that this is the best way to raise revenue? No, but if we're going to have a product and it's going to be legal, then we should treat it this way. If this is what voters want, and voters said, we want to tax marijuana sales, then that's how it should be treated, and that's what we're doing. And we're generating tens of millions of dollars in revenue for the state, which is going towards education programs regarding marijuana, regarding other, other things, as well as towards school construction, and, and quite frankly, whatever else the legislature wants, because they're the ones that put most of these taxes onto the ballot. It wasn't our campaign. But again, what it comes down to is this. Marijuana is out there. We didn't vote to have marijuana in Colorado. We voted to start controlling marijuana in Colorado. And right now, Colorado is doing more to control marijuana than any other state in the country, other than Washington, which also passed a similar law, and soon Oregon is going to have a similar system in place, and Alaska will have a similar system in place, and we expect to see about anywhere from five to 15 states over the next two or three years passing similar laws. So Colorado's really, a leader when it comes to this. Just like if you were to ask 
would it be uh, something to be embarrassed about if your state was the first to end alcohol prohibition? I think that that would generally be viewed as a badge of honor, as that our population was smart enough to recognize how stupid this failed government program was early enough and to put an end to it. And that's what Colorado has done. And right now it seems to be going quite well and we hope to see how it continues to go over the next several years, at which point we can make better judgments regarding its actual full on impacts. So thank you all very much and I guess go ahead and. It's trying to make me go all Bill, Bill O'Reilly on both of them running over. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm from North Carolina where consuming random distilled liquors that we don't know where they're from <laughs> is actually our state pastime. <laughs> But I choose not to take offense to that. Um, thank you both of you guys for laying out the philosophy. I kind of want to, uh, you're both, by the way, disappointingly reasonable in your points of view, <laughs> which really requires me to like go all Maury Povich up here. Um, but first <laughs> off, one of the things you guys are talking about, and one of the things that always comes up, and I, I want to stipulate in the, that in Colorado, because you have moved past the original debate of whether this is a good idea or a bad idea, let's talk about where we are. And that's what some, some of what you did in your opening statements. A lot of the discussion in the debate is going to be about competing data mm -hmm. moving forward. It hasn't been that long since the law passed. How do you guys possibly assess the data and figure out, is this credible? Is this statistically significant? And what does it mean for how we legislate? Well, lies, damn lies, and statistics, as they always say, uh, in this debate, you can find statistics and data to back any point of view, as you can with, with most things. Right. I will tell you, and you know, I, there certainly must be a lot of parents and grandparents in the audience here. I think that if you ask any parent of teenagers in this state, if things are the same as they were before legalization began, I'm guessing 90 plus percent of them will tell you that it is not the same. Anecdotally, I can tell you it's nowhere near the same. I've raised a lot of children and uh, I, I talk to a lot of parents and we as, at the Gazette have spoken with a lot of parents and a lot of community organizations and it is not the same. Uh, whether or not we should have legalized recreational marijuana is one discussion point. The other is, are we adequately regulating it as was promised by proponents of Amendment 64? And I believe the answer to that is no, because marijuana is very much more available to children, young children and teenagers than it ever was before. There, the uh, risk benefit uh, equation that anyone runs through their head when they are going to do something that they shouldn't be doing, like smoking cigarettes or sneaking off with a six pack of beer or whatever it may be. The risk factor is obviously lower than it was before. And the state is doing very little in terms of spending money to educate young people away from this drug and to keep it away from them. And in fact, uh, a lot of the drug education money that was promised from the revenues generated by marijuana sales have gone into advertising the safe use of marijuana. Well, and let me to let promote me, the sale of marijuana. On the data point, because you guys had a disagreement on whether youth use has gone up, let me ask about that. Where what are you referencing? Because a lot of times the argument is, well, kids are gonna have more access to this. And then the argument from the other side is, well, kids already had a lot of access to this. So we do have to evaluate whether it goes up or down. Mm -hmm. What statistic are you using? How, like, you're, you're focusing on some anecdotes, which I understand we're early right. in the game. What is your argument? I'm and is the state actually doing enough to regulate yeah. whether they can get uh, it? I'm citing the Colorado Healthy Kids Survey, which is a annual survey of, I believe it's about 15 or 20 or 1,000 or more uh, Colorado students from around the state. It's done by the Department of Education, the Department of Human Services, uh, uh, the Department of, uh, of Public Health and Environment. Um, and it's also done in conjunction with uh, I, the other statistics that they look at are those from the uh, Centers for Disease Control, the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Sur System Survey, which is done on an annual, or every other year. So I'm referring to our state and federal government surveys. And let me be clear, I am not suggesting that teen use appears to be going down because of this law. 
I'm not, I, I don't know. If I said that, I would, be, I would be making it up. I'm just saying that clearly it has not skyrocketed. Uh, the same with crime. I'm not saying that crime has apparently gone down because of this law, maybe so, maybe not. All I'm saying is that crime clearly has not skyrocketed as, as was predicted. I think that we are going to need to see a few more years of data uh, when it comes to the, the situation with driving. The Colorado State Patrol came out last year and said anyone who is saying that they, they know the effect that this has had on driving is, is giving you a bunch of crap because they said you, they could not provide a reasonable and educated uh, assessments of the actual impact of this law for at least a few years. And so I, I am fully ready to, to wait and see that. But you know, when it comes to the impact that it's having on young people, right now, over the last, uh, since 2010, Colorado high school graduation rates have increased every year. And since 2009, dropout rates have decreased every year. And rates of use have, according to the state, remained stable. I'm sure we associate with different parents. So we, we get different stories. Um, so I'm not, I'm not in any way suggesting that, that Mr. Logason is, 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 is you know, being disingenuous. I, I have no doubt that he hears concerns. I hear concerns from parents who say, I think that things are way better now. And that's just how it works. That's why we have elections. And, and what the voters wanted is, is to start regulating marijuana. They did. And, and you mentioned, you know, there was a... There was a survey, a scientific poll that came out of San Diego, some uh, pollster out of San Diego last week, that found waning support for uh, Amendment 64. It was sponsored it was by, by who? It was sponsored yeah. by an anti-marijuana organization, and okay. it had a lot of very interesting statistical issues with it. For example, um, they dramatically oversampled Republican and conservative voters. No offense to anyone here, but we do know that <laughs> we do know that statistically there's more support among 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 left leaning and, and, and independent voters than there are among conservative voters. For some reason, they had a sample that involved like 59% conservative and only like something like 32%. Then they also only took a, a sample. Their sample had only 9% uh, of it was between ages 45 and 55. Yet something like 27% of the people polled were between 65 and 75. So it raises some questions, not to mention who, who is conducting it. The Quinnipiac University ones have been done very regularly over the last few years, and they're not being paid for by a group that's trying to keep marijuana illegal. Well, well if you looked at the, at the specific questions in the poll, they had to do with how well is this being regulated, very well, not so, you know, and, and, and the bottom line is people are not satisfied with the way that marijuana is being regulated in Colorado. As far as the polling sample, I don't know, you know more about that than I do, but I do know that uh, conservatives and conservative libertarian crowds do not tend to be more anti-marijuana, I don't think, than, than democratic crowds. I, 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 don't, I don't sense that to be the case. Um, I've spoken maybe to a Mary lot of Catherine can, <laughs> I've, I've, but, I've seen um, a difference. As far as, um, you know, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2014 found that uh, high school-aged youth um, in Colorado, uh, we have a 56% higher than, than rate than the rest of the country. But uh, a more damning statistic, if you ask me, is 66% uh, increase in teenage admissions for marijuana addiction treatment in Colorado. That's according to the Arapaho, Arapaho House Treatment Network in Colorado. Now, is that since legalization? Or is that a longer period of time? That is uh, 2000, 2011 to 2014. But you have to understand, before we had recreational legalization in Colorado, we've had uh, medicinal marijuana since 2000. Right. Now, in 2000, and was it? Nine, Ogden memo roughly. was 2009, I believe, that the Obama administration uh, Justice Department came out with a memo that really changed everything in Colorado because nobody wanted to invest in medicinal marijuana in Colorado, so you didn't have all these retail outlets. You had very few. And one of the biggest ones was in Colorado Springs, and there was one and maybe a couple other little ones scattered around. As soon as that Ogden memo came out, they proliferated like crazy. I mean, every town had more medical marijuana retail shops than Starbucks or 7-Elevens. And so we've had, we have had retail marijuana for a number of years before we had recreational marijuana. And, and well, there's something that should really be pointed out, which is you said that um, you know there is a higher rate of use in Colorado, just mm -hmm. uh, according to the NSDUH. But you failed to point out that 
Since 2009, the usage rate, according to the federal government, has been going down in Colorado and up nationwide. So since 2009, since that year you just referenced, when medical marijuana really blew up and, and we started seeing these stores all over, it was at 24.8 and now it's down to 20. Whereas nationwide, we saw an increase during that same period of time. So the point is that that rate of marijuana use among high school students was occurring even when it was illegal. In fact, since 1975, uh, the Monitoring the Future survey has found that more than 80% of high school seniors in this country say it's easy to get marijuana, since 1975. So if the goal is to make it hard for young people to get marijuana by keeping it illegal for everyone, and more than 80% of, of, of high school students say that it's easy, it's time to try something new. And that's what Colorado's doing. Let me ask about unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. As conservatives and libertarians, we always recognize like there are gonna be some of those when you make a policy decision uh, on each side. And you know there can be good unintended consequences as well, so I don't wanna paint anybody into a corner. But what is the unintended consequence since the law that concerns you or that has, has really stood out to you? Well, you know, I'll be the first to say that I think that the situation with edible marijuana, which, which, uh, which, which Wayne brought up, is, is, a, is a good example. Um, I don't think it's the question of, is it now this epidemic of zombies and people dying? It's more a question of, well, how was this rolled out and how has it been working? What's really interesting about what ended up happening with edible marijuana and why the state didn't quite see it coming is that mar edible marijuana infused products affect the body very differently. Uh, when you eat marijuana, it takes upwards of an hour to take effect. Uh, it has a very different effect on your body. A lot of people aren't really familiar with how much they're supposed to use. So there's all these, these differences in it that a lot of people weren't familiar with. Now, during the medical marijuana years of 2008, 9, 10, 11, the only people that were really able to buy these products in the stores were people who had experience with them and knew what they were doing. And then all of a sudden, when you decided to start allowing adults who had no experience with them. People like Maureen Dowd. People like Maureen Dowd is a perfect example. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great example. That and was I, a disaster. Well, but I think it was, honestly, her experience really has educated a lot of people so that they now know what potential you know, harms there could be associated with this, and now they, they can judge for that. I mean, Maureen Dowd knew better than to show up in Denver and order a martini and then be, you know, within one minute say, I don't feel it, give me another three. <laughs> that, but you know, she just didn't know. She had no experience with it, and people weren't aware. And so I think that that has been the most interesting thing is that we have had some people who are not familiar with that product, and so the state has done a whole lot now to start to change that to you know, things like changing packaging, uh, requiring products to be marked, requiring uh, changing the way servings are handled so that it's broken into individual servings, uh, so that's not one candy bar with 10 servings, it's actually 10 separate things so that someone knows not to eat more than one. Like these are things that the state has learned and is doing. Um, Okay, well, you took mine, edibles, and so I'll, go, I'll probably move on to second, but while you're, I mean, yeah, the edibles thing has been a, a nightmare. The, the state has been trying to deal with it with packaging regulations and such. The problem is that what the Colorado Department of Health and Environment cannot figure out, and the legislature would like them to figure out, is what you do to label a bowl full of granola that's been taken out of the package and is laced with pot. So the, the, this labeling thing is not a panacea. It's far from it. Uh, there's still the problem with people who put cookies and candies and brownies into bowls and leave it out, and they don't think, well, they don't have any children around. Or maybe they do. Maybe they're just really bad parents. Uh, but children come around. And so this, I think we agree on this, that it's a crisis that needs to be solved. I don't think anybody anticipated that when Amendment six, when they voted for Amendment 64. Uh, so secondarily, I would say the, the lack of this law to eliminate the black market. I'm a libertarian and think in terms of uh, libertarian economics all the time, and it does seem that if you legalize something that's not legal, the black market vanishes the moment you do that. That has not been the, experiment, the experience in Colorado. Uh, we have cartels who have bought up and rented out uh, warehouses all over the state. They're renting, the rental market in Colorado, if you haven't heard, is through the roof. Nobody can afford to rent a house. And that is in part because a lot of grow operations are renting rental houses 
and, and using them as grow operations. And if you uh, talk to any of the attorneys general from the states that are suing us, they will assure you that the cartels are alive and well in Colorado and exporting pot into their states. So that is an unintended consequence. I certainly didn't anticipate. Furthermore, I didn't anticipate a commercialization to this extent. Again, I go back to, I was the guy who had friends around the campfire, everybody's getting high, and I didn't want to see any of them go to jail, and so this was a pretty good idea if you looked at it through that lens. What we have found out at the Gazette, again, is none of those people went to jail in the first place. So while there may be some things that have been gained through this, a lot of the promises were pretty empty at this point. And on the black market, yeah. tell me about your take on yeah. this, because I, I, um, I don't spend a lot of time <laughs> in it in Colorado, so I don't know what the outline is right yeah. now. Yeah, and I don't honestly know uh, what data is being referred to here. I don't know that anyone knows uh, the extent of the black market, but we do know that $700 million in marijuana sales took place in licensed businesses in Colorado last year. Well, where did those, you know, if usage rates are the same as they were a few years ago, where were those taking place before? in the underground market. So the only thing that we do know for a fact is that at least $700 million is no longer being exchanged for marijuana in the underground market. Um, one of the, well, anyone who thinks that the underground, that a, a legal market will eliminate an underground market in the course of 18 months, I think is, I don't think anyone would, uh, to, if that's how we're judging this law, then yes, you're right, we failed because we did not, eliminate a underground market built up over 80 years of prohibition in 18 months. Well, some of those sales that you talk about didn't exist before. I mean, Maureen Dowd is the classic example of someone who decided to buy and consume marijuana because it was legal. Okay. So there's some of that. Let's be conservative and, and say $300 million instead okay. of $700 million. We don't know the numbers. We That's know that exactly, but we do know that a lot of marijuana sales are now taking place in these stores. I mean, right. it, it, we do know, you know, we, uh, at the beginning we heard people say, well, it costs too much in the stores and that's going to result in the underground market maintaining. Well, no, now it costs the same in the stores on the street. And when you think about it, now that there are these stores, where do adults want to go? I mean, an adult who wants to use marijuana wants to access it in a way similar to an adult who wants to use alcohol. Do you want to find someone who has it and hope they have what you want and that it is what they say it is and that they're actually going to, to give it to you and you're going to be safe? And, uh, or do you want to just stop at the store? And what we're seeing, we're seeing sales have, have We've seen them going, they started very low, and now they've been getting higher and higher because people are starting to become more accustomed to this system. And there is a reason why more and more people are buying marijuana from the store instead of in the underground market. It's because sure. it's preferable in every way. But if you, are, if you are a producer in another place, whether it's Mexico or some other state, and you want the heat to be off of you, you want to lower your overhead, uh, by reducing the amount of security you need to operate underground, guess where you're going to come? You're coming to Colorado, Why and that's happening, and we, and we know it's happening because we know how much is being exported out of the state. Another underground feature that I didn't expect is we have this parallel system in Colorado. We have the uh, medical marijuana stores, and we have the recreational marijuana stores. Now, if you live in Colorado and you're a regular marijuana user, it's pretty stupid not to go to a marijuana doctor, and this is not your family physician, this is usually a doctor who does this for a living, writes marijuana prescriptions or whatever they call them, and you pay him 50 or $100, whatever the going rate is, and for a year you can then go buy what they call medicinal pot. It's no different than any other pot. It's the same, it's the same marijuana, whether it, you know, we can have a different debate as to whether it has medicinal qualities. I'm not a doctor. Uh, but you're going to save 20, what, 22%, 23%, something like that on taxes doing it that way. So that's another sort of underground market. And we have interviewed multiple teenagers who have now become adults, and we've interviewed them as teenagers. We've interviewed adults who used to be teenagers who talk about getting a red card and purchasing this stuff at a great discount and then selling it in the parking lot and hallways of schools. It's no different than... Uh, you know, when these schools forbid candy and soda. And so you'll always find some entrepreneurial kid who will go to Sam's Club or Costco, buy in bulk, come around and, and start a business in the parking lot in the, in the hallways. And so that's what we have going on. That's sort of a little side underground kind of thing we have going on because we have this ridiculous 
system of, of, of two competing types of retail. The market well, in blow pops was very high in my middle school. Let's, let's be clear. Well, number one, um, the amount of marijuana seized at the U.S. border on the U.S. side from Mexico has gone down in the last two years, and the amount seized on the Mexican side has gone down as well. Uh, they've also found less, fewer homicides, less violence. Now, again, I'm not saying that stems from this. I'm just saying that obviously it has not grossly increased as people are suggesting it has. Um, we've also seen, uh, I believe uh, in Wyoming, it was a 50% decrease in the amount of marijuana that they've seized uh, in 2014 compared to 13. Um, but back to this whole medical versus non-medical thing now, Let's say that alcohol was being treated this way. Would you go to the process of finding a doctor to give you a recommendation, which you would have to pay the doctor for, and then you'd have to submit an application to the state in order to, and pay a license fee in order to get this license so that when you went to buy a bottle of wine, it ended up being about a dollar, two, three dollars less? Most people wouldn't. Now, the thing that's resulting in some people choosing to remain medical marijuana patients instead of simply using the adult store is localities that are banning adult sales. Localities like Colorado Springs, and I believe the Gazette was opposed to allowing adult sales. And despite a majority of voters in Colorado Springs supporting Amendment 64 and believing marijuana should be legal and regulated and treated like alcohol, they voted four to three in the Colorado Springs City Council to ban adult sales. So well, the only way to access marijuana legally in Colorado Springs is through a medical marijuana store. And can you blame someone for wanting to do this legally instead of illegally? And next, uh, the, Amendment 64, in addition to making uh, legal recreational pot a, a possibility, when people voted for that, they didn't vote for legalizing marijuana all over Colorado. They voted for a law that said municipalities could decide. Absolutely. So that's what, and that, so that's what Colorado Springs and a lot of other. I think the only community in the Pikes Peak region that has legalized recreational marijuana is Manitou Springs. Uh, Pueblo County to the south has legalized it, but not Pueblo City. So, um, but as, I wanted to go back to one point. It would save a few dollars if you go and buy a hundred dollars worth of marijuana, which isn't a whole lot and you buy it uh, from a medical store, then you're not talking about a couple of dollars. I mean, do the math, 23% on $100. I don't know where you're pulling this 23%. Well, think, that's a made up number. I mean, that's just factually inaccurate. What are the taxes? The taxes are standard sales tax at the state level and the local level. You pay that on medical as well as adult use. So you're paying those taxes either way. What we're talking about is the state's 10% special sales tax. So that's 10%. Okay. And then you're just adding in the 15% excise tax, which is on wholesale transfers. So there's a big difference there, because what we're talking about is the 15% excise tax in Colorado is on wholesale transfers between a cultivation facility and a store. So when a cultivation facility produces a bunch of marijuana and then transfers it to a store to sell it, it's taxed at 15%. Now, about an ounce of marijuana at the wholesale rate is anywhere from, at this, this, this point, like $60, $50 to $100, versus buying it in a store where it's about $350 or $400, there's a big difference. Like, you can't just say that that 15% tax is something that a consumer pays. It's very disingenuous. Well, I think we'd have to, we'd ha hold on, we'd have okay. to establish how pervasive that gray market is to begin with, and we don't know the answer to that well, right now. So let me, and it's 420, so I want to move on to another okay. question. Real, can I real um, quick, can I just interject something real quick? We know that we have 503 medical stores in Colorado. I think the average age is about 22 of the patients. Uh, the average That's, age of these the patients. It's in the 40s, so, I hate to break so it So I, I, I don't understand. Minnesota has eight medical marijuana stores for their medical marijuana system. We have five, in excess of 500. Are we that sick? Are all the people using those medical marijuana stores <laughs> patients? Okay. Um, let me just <laughs> Quick. Uh, number one, there aren't more than 500 stores. You're basically saying any place that's a facility that produces products that grows marijuana is a store that you can walk into. By that's not how it works. It's, it's not the same. Uh, so the number of stores is far fewer. Uh, but quite frankly, the problem is that in Minnesota, they're already looking at changing their law because there's no access. Patients aren't able to access marijuana. Now, Colorado set up this system, and what we're seeing is when we passed Amendment 64, people said, well, everyone's going to keep using the medical system and never turn to the adult system. And what we've seen is a dramatic migration 
away from the medical system. Medical sales have gone down and adult use sales have gone up because people are no longer bothering going through the process of getting a recommendation unless there's someone who truly has that very significant medical need. They already get a recommendation from their physician. They don't need to go out of their way to get one and they just have a doctor who they already see. So, you know. I, okay. We're about to be out of time, so I want to do a quick uh, political discussion sure. of how this is playing for politicians in Colorado and more broadly for 2016, because we've got to talk about that, right? Uh, in the race, many Republican candidates even have said, look, I kind of am okay with this laboratories of democracy kind of thing. It's constitutional. It's what the founders intended. It's not my cup of tea, but I mean, even Ted Cruz has said this. Um, and then on the Democratic side, oddly enough, they're not super pro on the Democratic side. Even old hippie Bernie Sanders is not living it up enough to say that he, uh, <laughs> that he would be pro-legalization. So I'm interested in where you guys see the national politics of this going. But first, you can give me a little Colorado take on how, is it hurting or helping people as far as politics go? Well, I think the general consensus in uh, Colorado is that legalization has <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, stands to hurt politicians on the right. I'm not sure that's true. You were at CPAC this year right. uh, when, you know, I think it was, it, it seemed pretty obvious about half the crowd, the crowd was about evenly split. Of course, that's a much younger crowd. Uh, the general consensus that I hear from right of center, pund center pundits is that uh, League Amendment 64 is going to take a, uh, a purple state and very quickly make it permanently blue. I'm not, again, I'm not sure that's true. One of the reasons Amendment 64 uh, passed in Colorado and that we were the first state to, to do, and, and I think, I don't think there are very many places in the world that have uh, marijuana access as liberalized as we do here in Colorado, but one of the reasons for that was the uh, libertarian streak that runs through right of center politics in Colorado and has for a long time. Now, I know that people who were interested in appealing Amendment 64 were adamant about keeping it off of the 2016 ballot because they think it'll be a rallying point for uh, the Democrats. Again, I don't know that that's true, but that's, that seems to be the conventional wisdom and the, caution, the cautionary uh, tale being told by uh, political operatives on the right. Okay, folks, only one Colorado state legislator brought forward a proposal to repeal Amendment 64. John Morris, need I say more? Mm -hmm. now, John Morris is the only one, and obviously he's one that not a lot of people agreed with on a whole lot of things, which is why he's no longer in office. Um, you know, I think that elected officials now recognize that this is the direction in which the nation's going. Obviously, it's the direction in which the state's going. Uh, we see a majority of Americans now believe marijuana should be legal. And when you ask the question of, regardless of whether it's illegal or legal, should the federal government let states decide? You get 60, you know, in the 60s, uh, roughly anywhere from 60 to 67 percent saying, yes, we think that states should be the ones that decide what their marijuana policy should be and the federal government should butt out. And that's what we're seeing among a lot of these presidential candidates. Cruz, you mentioned, uh, has said that. Uh, uh, Carly Fiorina has said that. Uh, Trump has said that. Uh, but also, so is Hillary Clinton. Uh, so you are seeing on both sides. Uh, really, the only, you know, vociferous, you know, anti-marijuana candidates out there uh, are Chris Christie. Um, uh, Dr. Carson is, has, has certainly not been, not been very friendly on the issue. And uh, of course, Mike Huckabee, who also doesn't think alcohol should be legal. So, um, But uh, anyway, I, I think of the 23 candidates, uh, about nearing half of them have said something to the effect of, I think that we should see what happens here and that states should be able to do what they want. Yeah, I think it's interesting that Democrats don't take a few more risks on this, given what the polling looks like, especially a Bernie Sanders. And by the way, if you have uh, Joe Biden jump into the race, he's an old school drug warrior. Oh, yeah. They are going to be the square party on <laughs> marijuana, believe it or not, <laughs> if Joe Biden jumps in this race. This is the Republican winning ticket. I mean, this is a way to you know, mobilize younger people and make them want to listen to the rest of the Republican agenda so that they then maybe become interested. Yeah. Super short last question, just to bug both of you. Uh, what is, 18 months out, what is the other side's position that was most oversold? I think uh, revenue for schools and uh, regulated like alcohol. Okay. Uh, 
that Colorado would be hurt economically and that teen use would, would escalate and that we would see all sorts of problems as a result. There we have it, folks. I'm going to close it up. I'm going to be back here another time so that we can follow up. We'll have more data. We can learn more things about this adventure you're going on in Colorado. In the meantime, I'll research the black market. <laughs> <laughs> As for you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. Thank you to these wonderful panelists. Thank you, Mary Catherine.